Good morning and welcome to First Light. Today we're in Genesis chapter 33. Yesterday we looked at that powerful moment when Jacob and Esau met after being apart for 20 years and the very bad blood that was between them when they parted company. That moment was a testimony to the grace and the mercy of God. And let's pick up right there where we were and pick up a few loose ends today. In verse 12, Esau essentially says, well, let's go back home now. And Jacob suggests that Esau go on ahead. After all, Esau is with 400 men. Jacob's got flocks and herds, and many of them are nursing young. He's got children, uh, and they all need to go at a slower pace. In verse 15, Esau said, okay, well, well, let me leave some men with you. And my assumption would be that this was ultimately for protection. But Jacob declines that, and I'm impressed, though, at how gracious Esau is being. He's being nice, he's being polite, he's trying to make helpful suggestions. But at the end of the chapter, Jacob does not end up going where Esau lived, which was around Mount Seir. Now, Mount Seir is way down south, well below the Dead Sea, on the eastern side of the Jordan River. So if you've been with us through this study, it's it's well below Sodom and Gomorrah. It's, it's on down there. And Jacob does not go there. And the reason is given in Bible commentaries. There are a lot of people that try to come up with reasons for why Jacob did not go down there. The Bible doesn't say either way. You can go back to chapter 31 where God tells Jacob to go home. And then all it says is that God told him to go back to the land of his fathers and relatives. So some people assert that, yes, Jacob and Esau had the most wonderful reunion and meeting, but that was just one meeting. And deep down, Jacob doesn't trust Esau. I mean, he could have been lying. He could have been faking. And that might be, but in my mind, there's no indication that that is what's going on here. To me, a a simpler, a simpler explanation is that Esau has moved farther away than the family had been living. So the family had lived on the southern side at some points of parts of the, what we would now call Israel today, but then uh, Esau moved to the east on the bottom side of the Dead Sea. He moved farther away than the family had ever lived before. And in fact, if you follow the rest of the Bible, where Mount Seir is, that area is not even really going to be part of the nation of Israel in the future. It's not really part of the promised land in the future. Mount Seir is on the north side of the geographic region that will one day be called Edom. Esau is the father of the Edomites. So the answer may simply be that Jacob just didn't want to go that far south. So verse 17 says that Jacob stopped at a place and built shelters for the animals. Now a shelter in Hebrew is called Succoth. And so Jacob named that place Succoth, and it was probably around the middle of the Jordan River Valley. And what's interesting to me is that Succoth actually became a holiday, uh, a holy day of commemoration for the the Hebrew people. Many years later, under under the laws of Moses, uh, we tend to call it the Feast of Tabernacles where people lived in little booths. If you're a King James person or grew up with it, that was the Feast of Booths. Well, a booth is a little tabernacle. It's it's a little house. It's, in Hebrew, a succoth. And in Hebrew, the Jewish people, they they name this, instead of the Feast of Tabernacles, they call it succoth. That's the name of the holiday. Well, wherever this area of succoth is, 
Jacob didn't stay all that long because look at verse 18. After Jacob came from Padam Aram, he arrived safely at the city of Shechem in Canaan and camped within sight of the city. Now, Shechem is right in the middle of the promised land. And that's why I think that Jacob just didn't want to go down that far south. He wanted to be right in the middle. So let's keep reading. Verse 19, for a hundred pieces of silver, he bought from the sons of Hamor, the father of Shechem, the plot of ground where he pitched his tent. There he set up an altar and called it El Elohe Israel. Now, I find this interesting, friends. We know from the end of chapter 35 that Isaac is still living at this moment. He's very old, and he's living at his home place in Hebron, which is somewhat on the south side of the land from where uh, Jacob is, where Jacob is right now. So Jacob is intentionally moving more northern. So it's interesting to me that Jacob, who has the birthright, remember, he does not go back to the place where his father Isaac is living. He does not demand or ask for anything related to the inheritance, which would rightfully be his. He has the birthright. He didn't live with his father and become the head of the clan. Instead of living off of some inheritance, he chooses to go off and purchase his own piece of land. And this is rather amazing to me because remember the family curse passed down from generation to generation in this family. It's the curse of greed and all the lying and deception that goes with it. Greed. And what does Jacob do? He does the opposite of greed. Instead of getting something free from daddy, he goes off and buys his own place. The one who has the birthright goes off and buys his own piece of property. And friends, this by itself is as clear as an example as I can think of, of how far Jacob has come. This really shows that the curse which had been operating in and controlling his life and members of his family's life, that this curse has now been broken in his life. And let me just remind you how this curse was broken. God did it by bringing pain into Jacob's life. Through this pain, God opened Jacob's eyes to the pain that he himself had been causing other people. The same pain drove Jacob to God and to seek God. This pain, I don't know how to phrase it, calmed him down. It, it matured him. It, we would often say it broke him. That's the way we'd say today. Like the image of a horse, a wild stallion. Which is to say that it humbled him. And all of it over the course of 20 years. In that time period, this curse has been broken and removed from Jacob's life. And if God could do it for him, I know he could do it for you too, friends. And he has done and is doing that in my life. I'm a testimony of this same exact procedure. And friends, if all of that's true, and if you yourself are deep in your struggle with something that has cursed your family, some, some horrible personality trait like we're seeing here, some deep dysfunction, I hope you can see what you need in the midst of your struggle. First of all, you need patience. The life of faith really is a journey. It's a journey. The Christian life is a call to join a journey. It's a journey through pain and suffering that we bring on ourselves and a journey of healing with God, a journey of learning and growing. Watch out for discouragement, which is ultimately a tool of Satan and the enemy. You got to watch out. You can't get bogged down. 
Jacob spent 20 years growing through this, and look at what God did. So don't you get discouraged after six months or one year. Next, I would suggest that uh, it's so important to be part of a community of faith. Now, I know there was no church back then. There was no nation of Israel, but Jacob had his family. He had those people around him. He grew in his relationship and his trust of his wives. It's important to be part of a community of faith. And I'm telling you, friends, today in modern times, a church family makes all the difference in the world, being connected to other Christians. And if you're in the middle of a struggle, friends, I'm telling you, you need to hold on to hope. Because God is good. He's got a plan and a purpose for your life, and you need to hang on. I love the saying that I heard somebody else say many, many years ago. Maybe you've heard it too. I love it. The saying goes like this. God loves you just the way you are, but he loves you too much to leave you that way. That is a great picture of the grace and the mercy of God and the work of the Holy Spirit ongoing in the human life, the Christian life. Let's pray together. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for not giving up on us. Thank you for your long suffering. Thank you for your patience and your endurance in dealing with our sin and our rebellion. We pray, Lord, that you would keep your hand upon us Draw us, woo us unto yourself. Send your Holy Spirit to strengthen us as we seek to be more and more surrendered to you. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Have a blessed day and I look forward to being with you in worship on Sunday, either in church or online. Join us as we worship together. This is First Light.